What is good, everybody? Welcome back to another My Damn Toys video. Today, we are reviewing the WWE Elimination Chamber pay-per-view for 2024. Now, coming into this show, I was very excited for the show just for some different aspects. You know, the Elimination Chamber is always very fun. And also, just, you know, it's one of my favorite stipulation matches outside of the Royal Rumble, Money in the Bank. Elimination Chamber is up there with the best of them, man. It's not as intense as it once was. I think the chamber that I grew up with and maybe a few of you also grew up with was much more intense, you know. with I mean, I guess the entire era was much more intense. However, you know, man, I think that we're still in for a good chamber. I think this, the chamber match itself is stacked, and we're going to have some good matches on this card, man. But with all that being said, would the show would it be good? Would it be shitty? Would it be somewhere in between? Let's dive into the matchup, find out what it's all about, and see how Elimination Chamber 2024 went. So our show opens up in Australia with the Women's Elimination Chamber matchup, man. We had Becky Lynch, Naomi, Liv Morgan, Tiffany Stratton, Raquel, and Bianca Belair. And this matchup started out really slow, man. I got to be real. It started out slow, Becky and Naomi, it looked like they were moving in slow motion, man. I mean, I know it was 4 a.m. It was very early, but I was like, my God, man, can somebody pick it up? It's like they had these sequences really that they really wanted to do, you know, the chain wrestling and things like that, but it's like they kind of, I don't know, they were kind of like half doing it, like they weren't fully confident in what they were actually doing there at the beginning, man, but it really picked up a lot when Tiffany Stratton came in. A lot, man, and everybody had on some pretty cool gear. It almost looked like Wolfpack NWO gear from Becky Lynch. Tiffany Stratton had some bright gear on. It was, it was, it was some good gears in this matchup. But Naomi goes for a sunset flip. It was more of like that overhead block style move, you know, where you like grab the neck and flip over more than a sunset flip, power bomb or what have you. But she does that to she does that to Liv Morgan. But when she lands, Tiffany Stratton takes advantage and actually pins Naomi and, and eliminates her. And then things really took another step once Bianca came in. She locked Tiffany inside of a pod. When Raquel finally got in, Liv Morgan came in and did a seated senton from the top of the pod onto Raquel. It looked freaking ridiculous. It was insane. Tiffany Stratton and Becky Lynch do war on top of a pod until finally Stratton bounces her face off the pod and then shoves her off onto Raquel. And then Tiffany Stratton hits a damn swanton bomb off the top of the pod onto the rest of the field, which was super crazy. Tiffany Stratton's a beast, man. She's really become one of my favorite women to watch on WWE television. Raquel hits a double bomb on Liv and Becky. Bianca hits her with a KOD and eliminates her. We're down to the final three. Liv Morgan, Bianca Belair, and Becky Lynch. Liv launches Bianca into the pod. It looked very forced. She did like a, you know, like one of those launching type maneuvers. It never looks right in wrestling for the most part, unless, you know, it, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to really make it look true. Bianca hits a crazy nonchalant 450 out of nowhere, man. It's like, oh, she's just gonna do a splash, and then out of nowhere, she just does a 450. It was absolutely nuts. I don't know how the hell she did that. She's a freak of nature, man. She is such a good athlete. But she does this 450, but Becky Lynch gets the knees up, hits her in the sternum there. Bianca tries KOD on Lynch. Lynch kind of reverses it and saves herself. Liv Morgan with the roll-up from behind. Manhandle slam. Rock bottom, whatever. One, two, three, Becky Lynch wins. I thought that they would give it to Liv. You know, I think she has the most impactful story. But they did give it to Becky Lynch here. Now, I don't have a huge problem with Becky Lynch because I like Becky Lynch a lot. I think she's fantastic. But that really, I don't know, man. I really thought that they were going to give it to Liv Morgan. I just think it tells the best story there. But I guess they don't want the underdog matchup in this scenario. They want the first time ever Becky Lynch versus Rhea Ripley. And I think that is a star-studded match. I think it's going to be a great match. Can't wait to see it. Two, actually, probably my two favorite women in WWE, like the, the wrestling talents there. Going ahead to head at WrestleMania, so that's going to be epic for me as well. So I do look forward to that. Becky Lynch versus Rhea Ripley should be a, an absolute slapper, but this matchup was fun. You know, it started out slow. I don't know, it got a bit tough at certain moments, maybe a little bit rocky, but overall, man, very fun. Very fun matchup, cool spots. I thought it moved around well. I thought the story they told and everything was very fun. I like the ending sequence, but Becky Lynch does win. She will get her matchup with Rhea Ripley, and I'm all for that, to be honest with you. So Becky Lynch does win the Elimination Chamber in her first appearance in the matchup ever. Next up, man, we had the WWE Undisputed Tag Team Championship match between the Judgment Day and the New Catch Republic, Pete Dunne versus Tyler Bate. Now, coming into this matchup, this is one of the matches I was most looking forward to because I figured it would probably have that classic old-school NXT black and gold feel to it, and I was right, man. Near falls and, and such athletics. It's such a fun matchup right here, man. Judgment Day doing war here with Tyler Bate and Pete Dunne, and I love Tyler Bate and Pete Dunne. Like, I love Finn Balor. If you watch the channel, you know this, right? And, you know, like, I'm not a huge fan of Damian Priest, but I know that in the certain context, he can actually go in the ring pretty well, and he's, he's he, I think he compliments Finn very well in their tag team efforts here, but 
Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate did a fantastic job in this matchup in mixing with the Judgment Day. Just exactly what you want out of a tag team matchup, man. And Dominic on the outside getting the heel heat and whatnot was excellent. He played an excellent role in this thing, interfering with the matchup the way he did with the heel antics. Just a very fun matchup, man. Just a breath of fresh F and air, you know what I mean? Just one of those matches that you watch and it's just a good time. It's one of those just true classic wrestling matches that you can sit down and just watch and enjoy with every bit of yourself. So this is a very fun matchup. However, the Judgment Day do retain the tag titles, and I thought maybe we'd see the fallout of the bloodline here, but I think at Mania is where we're going to start to see that fallout. They lose the tag titles, and then it's going to be all down here from there, and I think that that'll be the case there, man. But it was a really fun matchup, a great shot of these guys. Just overall, a amazing matchup. I really enjoyed this thing, man. So the Judgment Day do retain, but it was everything I wanted out of the matchup, everything I expected, and yeah, I mean, can't really say much more here. Then we had the Grayson Waller effect with Grayson Waller and Austin Theory coming out with their guests Seth Rollins and Cody Rhodes. And this this just seemed like they were padding for time. I know they only had four matches on the card or what have you, but this was ridiculous. They, I mean, Jesus Christ, man. It just seemed like this set this segment lasted forever, it felt like. The entrances were long and everything like that. But ultimately, Cody Rhodes made a challenge to The Rock and said, you know, I'll fight you anywhere, any place. And then Seth Rollins basically said, if you do that, you know the bloodline never fights alone, so I'll be in your corner. Kind of sort of hinting towards a tag team match or some sort of matchup like that. And then they beat the hell out of Grayson Waller and Austin Theory. Or they beat the hell out of Austin Theory and Grayson Waller just watched. So that's pretty much what this segment was. But yeah, it was pretty much just stat padding at this point. Next up, man, we had the Men's Elimination Chamber match. And this matchup I was very much looking forward to. Like I said, it was probably the match that I was most looking forward to outside of the tag team match between the Judgment Day and Tyler Bate and Pete Dunne. But in this matchup, similar to the women's, it started out very slow in my opinion. It was, I don't know, there were certain things about it that were kind of, I don't know, they just kind of bored me a little bit there at the beginning. But then... Things did pick up. Drew McIntyre did eliminate Bobby Lashley. And I think from there, it really picked up, man. I mean, AJ Styles came out and beat the hell out of LA Knight. This made no sense. So AJ Styles comes out at one point in the matchup, and he beats the hell out of LA Knight with a chair. And I had no idea where he came from. You know, I, I miss the days where the chamber was, you couldn't get in that thing. You know, Shawn Michaels coming from underneath the floor was very creative. But then, you know, guys just showing up out of nowhere. I don't know how I feel about that. But, you know, he showed, he showed up with a chair, beat the hell out of LA Knight with a chair, hit the Styles Clash onto the chair, eliminated him. Drew McIntyre going for the Claymore on Kevin Owens. He reverses it into a pop-up powerbomb. Randy Orton hits Kevin Owens with an RKO after he goes for a pop-up powerbomb. Eliminates KO. So we're down to Randy Orton, Logan Paul, and Drew McIntyre. Logan Paul pulls the Brass Knucks out of his tights. I was like, what the hell is this guy doing? I mean, I knew the Brass Knucks were coming. I was like, I had some people over while watching the show. They were staying at our house this weekend. And he's reaching into his pants. And I'm like, I bet they're like, what the hell's even that? I don't know what's going on. But he pulls out the Brass Knucks and he starts yelling for no reason. He's just in the middle of the ring yelling. Why is he yelling? Randy Orton hits him with an RKO. Of nowhere. It was a great camera work right there, but he eliminates Logan Paul, and I noticed that Logan Paul's kind of hanging out. He doesn't get up and leave. He's like kind of hanging out. I'm like, oh damn, did he hurt himself? You know, that was my first thought, but then Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton are having a nice little singles match in there, and I'm like, Logan Paul is still in there, man. Did he break his nose or something on the RKO? Like, why are they taking forever? And then it made sense. Randy Orton hits an RKO on Drew McIntyre. It looks like he's going to win. I'm like, holy shit, he's about to win, and then brass knucks to the face. Logan Paul knocks Randy Orton unconscious. Logan Paul costs Randy Orton. Drew McIntyre pins Randy Orton, and now Drew McIntyre is going on to WrestleMania to take on Seth Rollins, which is the matchup we all wanted. It kind of was predictable, to be honest, but this is the matchup that we deserve. This is the matchup we wanted to see, and Drew McIntyre, I do believe, is going to finish the story at WrestleMania and take out Seth Rollins, so that will have to be a thing there, but Drew McIntyre does win the Elimination Chamber, punches his ticket to WrestleMania, and I'm very much looking forward to it, man. I can't wait for it. I think it's going to be a very exciting matchup, and I think it's going to check all the boxes for us. I, I'm really excited to see how it all plays out, but Drew McIntyre does win. Well-deserved, right winner, in my opinion. Saw it coming from a mile away, and I can't wait for WrestleMania now. But overall, I thought the matchup was solid. It turned into a solid matchup, kind of started slow, but then it did fill itself out and turn into a pretty epic one. And then for our main event, we had Rhea Ripley main eventing, and I'm guessing this was because we were in her home country, so you know they wanted to send her off nice there. And there really wasn't any doubt in my mind that she would win this matchup, retain the championship. You know, her versus Becky is the money matchup, or her versus Liv, whoever, you know, they decided to go with there. But of course, we know now, no, it's going to be Rhea versus Becky, but I had no doubt in my mind that it would be Rhea Ripley toting the championship. You know, Nia Jax has improved greatly. Used to not be able to even watch her matches, man. 
but she has come so far, and this matchup was probably her best match of her career, at least in recent memory. I think these two did a fantastic job in this match, man. I was really intrigued. I was really entertained the entire time. Really locked in. I'm sure everybody was a fan of Rhea Ripley's gear tonight, or this morning. But yeah, it was a fun matchup, man. I had a lot of fun with the matchup. Just, I found myself enthralled with it. I was invested into it. They did a great job in some heavy spots, man. Nia Jax put on a show, man, with Rhea Ripley. Rhea Ripley and Nia Jax probably put on the best match of, of Nia Jax's career so far, and I enjoyed the matchup, man. And Rhea Ripley retained, so it was a good way to end the show. I think that the men's chamber match probably should have been evented, but I didn't mind the... I don't mind the women's championship main eventing, you know? You know, elevates the championship. Rhea Ripley gets the homecoming there. I think her family was ringside, so it was a good, a good way to end the show. Good way to end the show, and at the end of the day, I enjoyed the show. I'm gonna be real. It didn't feel like there were a lot of stakes in this thing. I know that kind of sounds crazy, but it kind of felt like a live event a little bit. It had live event feels to me, or a, like Saudi show kind of feels to me, at least. I don't know. Anybody else get that vibe? That's just the vibe that I got, but at the end of the day, it was a fun, and it doesn't matter if it was a live show or a Saudi event anyway. I enjoyed the matchups. You know, I enjoyed everything, and we got some really good storylines and stuff that played out. Some matches were very fun, so, you know, I enjoyed it overall, man, and that's all you can really ask for out of a premium live event, as they call it nowadays, which I think sucks. I'm always going to call it a pay-per-view. It doesn't matter. 34 years into the future, I'm still going to call it a pay-per-view, and people are going to be like, Grandpa, you're an idiot, and I'm going to say, back in my day, they were called pay-per-views. You had to pay a quarter just to get it on the Channel 3. But nonetheless, man, I'm getting the hell out of here. Fun show overall, but that's going to wrap up my... Pretty much full review of Elimination Chamber 2024, man. I'd love to know all of your thoughts down in the comment section below, man. What do you guys think about everything? Leave me all that down in the comment section below, man. Check out the WWE Action Figure News as well that we posted the last few days. Check out the videos on the channel, man. I greatly appreciate it, but that is going to wrap it up for me here, man. Thank you guys so very much for watching. Hope you guys did enjoy. Let me know all of your thoughts down in the comment section below on all these things, man, but I'm getting out of here. Huge shout out to our Patreon members of the MDT YouTube channel. Always appreciate all those fellows over there, man. Thank you guys so very much for all that you guys do for me on a daily and monthly basis. I'm getting out of here, man. Thank you for watching. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at MyDamnToys. Have a blessed one. I'll catch you guys later. And that's it.